terrified. Two siblings abandoned at birth finally meet. My two people from the one family for the first time meeting, it's just it's an incredible feeling. You know, you have so much to say. You just want to, you know, explode nearly. <laughs> and their family search wasn't over. There were more revelations to come. Join us after the news. ABC News, is Fiona MacDonald. In the past hour, the British government's controversial attempt to send asylum seekers to Rwanda has been blocked by a series of courts in both London and Europe. British officials have confirmed that the first flight to Rwanda has been grounded and the asylum seekers have been removed from the plane. The NATO Secretary General says the Alliance is stepping up its provision of heavy weaponry to Ukraine. Jens Stoltenberg was responding to repeated calls from the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky for more long-range artillery. Tigrayan forces who have been at war with the Ethiopian government for more than 18 months say they're ready to send a high-level delegation to talks mediated by Kenya. Earlier, Ethiopia's Prime Minister said his government favoured negotiations to end the war. There's been a sharp rise in the price of natural gas on European markets after a major US producer announced that one of its export terminals would remain closed for months. Freeport LNG said an explosion last week had halted operations at the plant in Texas. Lebanon has proposed a deal aimed at resolving a long-running maritime dispute with Israel. The heated row came to a head earlier this month when Israel made preparations to begin oil and gas exploration in waters partly claimed by Beirut. A senior Pakistani minister, Ahsan Iqbal, has urged people to drink less tea to help the government reduce its import bill. Mr Iqbal said the government had been borrowing money to buy in the much-loved beverage, and if people reduce consumption by one or two cups a day, it would help the economy. And Costa Rica have claimed the final place in this year's Football World Cup tournament in Qatar. They beat New Zealand 1-0 in the Intercontinental Playoff to reach their third finals in a row. BBC News. Hello and welcome back to Outlook on the BBC World Service with me, Andrea Kennedy. Today we're hearing the story of the Tartan babies. David McBride and Helen Ward, who as newborns were left clearly well dressed and cared for in tartan patterned bags. David was found in the passenger seat of a stranger's car in Northern Ireland, and years later Helen in a phone box a few miles south of the border. They were both then adopted by other families, and years later each of them went looking for their birth mother. But what they found was each other. They're full siblings. Let that sink in. Whoever left David in 1962, six years later, would have a child with the same man and leave that baby, Helen, too. In part one, we heard how on her 44th birthday, Helen went live on the radio to share her story with the public for the first time. Within minutes, she spoke to the policeman who'd been on duty the night she'd been found. And then later, the lorry driver, the man who'd stepped into the phone box and found a baby, baby Helen, also came forward. And that was extremely emotional. <laughs> when he went into the phone box, he saw a bag on the floor and he noticed that the bag was moving and he opened it a little bit more and he saw me in it. Wow. It was incredible. Like, it's, it's kind of un unimaginable, really. The feeling about it, you know. I mean, it must be really something to find someone who can tell you the circumstances of that moment. You know, you as a tiny little baby in the phone box, and that's your strongest connection you have at that point to your mother, no? Absolutely. It's incredible because he is the very first person to have picked me up since perhaps my birth mother put me in that bag. And to just listen to him tell me the story of that night. It was just lovely to have those conversations with him. Yeah. Beautiful to make that connection with these two men who I think feel the story deeply as well, don't they? Absolutely. When I went to visit Sergeant Michael Keneally, I got to meet all his family. I felt like the Queen coming to his house that particular day. The china was out, the carrot cake was out. They brought me around and dog. They showed me exactly where the phone box had been. They showed me so much. They told me so much. 
you kind of feel that you're getting somewhere. Mm. And then, all of a sudden, the trail goes cold again. The bottom line is there was no information on my birth mother. There was nothing. She thought the trail had gone cold, but then a few years later, a friend bought her a DNA test as a present. Helen took it and sent it off, hoping it would get her closer to her mother. But what, or who she found, of course, was David. He'd been working with the British TV show Long Lost Family, and now that Helen's DNA was officially registered too, they made the connection and called her up to break the news. What did that feel like to find out that you had a brother? It was incredible. It was unbelievable. I had just left my friend's house and I was just sitting in my car. I kept pinching myself to see, and I was like, oh my God. Did I hear her right? Did she just tell me I had a real brother? And not only that, because she was explaining the situation of the Long Lost Family show, she asked that I would keep it quiet. So I wasn't able to tell anybody till October until I had met David. How do you keep that quiet for so long? <laughs> you talk to your dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. What's that weight like? Oh, <laughs> it was every day you wake up, you're thinking about it, you say to yourself, oh my God, like, I thought it was just me. Because when you discover yourself as a foundling, you think you're the only one. And now you have a brother. And David, what about you? I mean, does this all time with you? Do you have to keep it quiet as well? Well, I was fine because I only found out about Helen the week before I met her. But, you know, it was tough because even in that period of time, they said, like, don't say anything to anyone. I couldn't even tell my mother back in Ireland because I knew as soon as I told my mother she'd be on to all our relatives and we've got quite a big family and then it would have been out on the grapevine. Facebook would have been covered at that point. So it was probably the longest week of my life. It just seemed to go on forever. Oh, I can imagine. And so that moment where you come face to face and I'm looking at both of you and there really are similarities in your faces. Can you describe that moment when you see each other for the first time and recognize physical traits and know that you're talking to a blood relative? How does that feel like? I think it's very surreal. I think there's so much excitement. You're trying to take everything in. You're trying to talk just to try and tell our stories. We're two people from the one family for the first time meeting. It's just, it's an incredible feeling. You know, you have so much to say. You just want to explode now, I think. Yeah. Did you feel an instant connection? Yes. As soon as we met, everything around us didn't seem to exist. It was just me and Helen. We didn't even realise the cameras were there. We just sat and we talked. We showed each other photos. And it was as if we'd really known each other all our lives. It just seemed so natural. And now that you've found each other, I guess then a search begins again for your parents. That's right. What stories did you have in your head? I imagine that you must have conjured up stories of who they might have been. It's hard to picture her because you've got this belief that there was no choice. She was young. This is what happened. But you can't actually picture your mother. It's a difficult thing to do. Mm. And what about your father? Did you have any thoughts about him? Never. Not really. Never thought about my father once. I think with the background in Ireland and how women are treated or were treated, there was never a concern about the man. They just got on with their lives. They weren't pillarized or sent to Coventry, if you want to say, whereas the woman was segregated, put out. And so I never thought about my father. I always just thought about my mother. Mm. The TV show did find out some information, didn't they, about both of your birth parents, but sadly they'd both died by that stage. That must have been a difficult piece of information to take in. I found it quite difficult. I just found it very saddening that they had gone, because the whole journey was the hope that someday I would sit down and be able to speak with her, to find out her life, to find out why she had put me up for adoption or left me, should I say, in a phone box. There were so many questions, but now she was gone. Yeah, it was a sad day to find out that our parents had passed away, particularly our mother. Your whole world sort of falls in because, like Helen, when we started this journey, we just wanted to know why. 
and we wanted to meet her, her mother. Mm. She lived to a very good age, didn't she? She died, I think, when she was 90, is that right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We were so close to finding, but then obviously wasn't meant to be. Mm. So what did you find out about them and about their story? Well, our mother was a country girl. Our father was a city boy. She was a lot younger. The bright lights brought her from the west coast of Ireland, from Kerry up to, to Dublin. She was called Marcella, and um, her father was a band leader in Dublin, and my mother, Marcella, met our father when she was probably going to the dance halls, and um, they had an affair which lasted 40 years or more. So he was married? Yes, he was married. And she was Catholic, is that right? And he was Protestant? And that's right, yeah. With our birth father, he had a family of 14 children. So we now have 14 half-siblings, which was a huge surprise to us. Thankfully, we've got to communicate with some of them. So it is a huge impact on their life too. There has to be a great amount of respect given to everybody and we try to encourage people, you know, to not be afraid to tell us as much as possible. If they know something, please tell us because it's so important to us to build that picture and to learn about them. Whether it was a secret or not is debatable and we don't know. But to have two children and to have this affair go on for so long and to be together for so long, they must have loved each other. Mm. They must have had a pretty strong relationship for it to last for so long. And the fact that one of them was Protestant and one of them was Catholic and your mother would have been unmarried would have made the whole situation incredibly complex, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's all of the taboos at once, isn't it? Yeah. Catholic, Protestant, married, out of wedlock. So normally in these situations there may be one taboo broken, but for all three taboos to be broken in a country like Ireland, what hope did they have? Yeah. You've seen photographs of both of them. What was that like? Yeah, for me it was quite bizarre to see a picture of my father because apparently I look so much like him. You do. Yeah. I've yeah. seen the picture. You really do. Yeah. Oh, how does it feel to look at that, though, to look at that photo and recognise your own features in it? It's uh, quite surreal, to be quite truthful. For years, you, you can... I don't know, Helen's probably been in the same situation. You walk down the street and you look at people and you sometimes think, you wonder where you get your looks from or where your little traits from. And yeah. We've never known for such a long period of time and now we do know. And suddenly you're looking at someone who looks so much like you. It is quite surreal. But the story doesn't end there. While they were filming the TV show, Helen had a revelation of sorts. She recalled a story she'd read about during her early days of research and it made her think. Could there be another full sibling out there? The story was that a baby was found in 1965 in a phone box. He was found in a bag. He had a, a warm bottle. So all the pieces of information that were part and parcel of his story were part and parcel of my story. And part and parcel of David's story. And I think at that moment in the car with David, I really felt there was a very strong possibility that this person could be our full sibling. And the strange thing about it was, was Helen told the TV company of her thoughts. And the TV company sort of ignored it, didn't they, Helen? They yeah. didn't do anything yeah. with it. I think they'd thought, like I'd thought, <laughs> maybe this is, maybe, maybe my sister's going to do lolly. Thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe all this filming's got to both of us. The idea was dismissed, but then after their show aired, it turned out that Helen's hunt was right. A young woman in Australia saw them on TV and immediately thought about her Irish dad. She was um, looking at the programme in Australia, sitting in her tartan pyjamas one evening. I must be in the blood somewhere. <laughs> and she got in touch with her dad and said, you have to look at this programme. I feel there's something up with this. They could be your sister, they could be your brother. And she got in touch then and we got to meet John in... We got to speak to him for the very first time in April 2021. So John is... He was born in 1965, so he's the middle. He's the middle child. What was that like, meeting him? When the three of us actually sat down to meet, it was 